Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Many of us are familiar with the wonderful Disney story of Dumbo, the flying elephant. I remember coming across the cartoon as a kid, many of you have as well. On one level, it's an inspiring story of this little one who discovers this incredible magical ability. And we're going to talk about the process of coming in touch with a potential that someone else sees before we're able to really hold it ourselves. We'll talk about the importance of having a symbol to represent our potential. We'll talk a little bit about the absolutely important role of a relationship, both in the therapeutic process of analysis, but also in being companioned throughout our life. Because often it's our friends or the people who love us that see what we could be. When we're particularly feeling low, or misunderstood or alienated. And at the end of our discussion, we're going to interpret a dream submitted by a retired teacher where an elephant plays a central role in helping her make a major life transition. So we look forward to talking about all of this with you. And so now, here is the story of Dumbo the Elephant. It was spring, spring in the circus. After the long winter's rest, it was time to set out again on the open road. Toot, toot, whistled Casey Jones, the locomotive of the circus train. (laughs) All aboard, shouted the ringmaster. The acrobats, the jugglers, the tumblers, the snake charmers scrambled to their places on the train. The keepers locked the animal cages. Then with a jiggity jerk and a brisk puff puff, Off sped Casey Jones. The circus was on its way. Everyone was singing. Everyone was happy. Happiest of all was Mrs. Jumbo, for in her stall was a chubby, brand new baby elephant. Though the other animals called the baby Dumbo, his mother loved him dearly, even though his ears were big. All night, while the baby animals slept, Casey Jones whistled and puffed, hauling the long train to the city where the circus was to open its show. It was dark when he pulled into the station. Rain poured down hard, but the circus began to unload. The roustabouts jumped down from the freight cars. They lighted torches and stuck them in the ground. Men and animals came bustling out of the train onto the, into the windy, wet night. Mrs. Jumbo worked with the others, and her baby helped a little. By morning, the rain had stopped, the tent was all set up, and the circus was busy getting ready for the big parade. The band played. Everyone fell in line. Then off pranced the gay procession down the main street. There were creamy white horses, licorice-colored seals. There were lady acrobats in pink silk tights, Lions pacing in their gilded wagon cages, elephants marching with slow, even steps. The crowds on the sidewalk cheered. Then suddenly their eyes opened wide. They craned their necks. Look, look, they cried. Look at that silly animal with the draggy ears. He can't be an elephant. He must be a clown. Sadly, Dumbo toddled behind his mother with his trunk clasped to her tail. He tried to hurry along faster so he wouldn't hear the laughter, but he stumbled. He tripped over his ears. Down he splashed into a puddle of mud. Now the crowds... Sorry. uh, 
Now the crowds laughed even louder. Mrs. Jumbo scowled at them. She picked Dumbo up and carried him in her trunk the rest of the way. When the parade finally came back to the tent, everyone hustled to get ready for the afternoon show. Mrs. Jumbo put Dumbo in her wooden bathtub, and as she scrubbed, she whispered comforting words. A gang of noisy boys came pushing in first for the afternoon show. We want to see the elephant, they yelled, the one with the sailboat ears. Look, there he is. A boy grabbed one of Dumbo's ears and pulled it hard. Then he made an ugly face and stuck out his tongue. Mrs. Jumbo couldn't stand it. She snatched the boy up with her trunk and spanked him hard. Help, he cried. Help, help. What's going on here? cried the ringmaster, rushing forward with his whip. Tie her down, he yelled. Soon she was behind the bars in the prison wagon with a big sign that said, Danger, Mad Elephant, Keep Out. The next day, they made Dumbo into a clown. They painted his face with a foolish grin and dressed him in a baby dress. On his head, they put a bonnet. They used him in the most ridiculous act in the show, a make-believe fire. Every night he had to jump from the top of a blazing cardboard house down into a fireman's net. The audience thought it a great joke, but Dumbo felt disgraced. He's a disgrace to us, the big animals agreed, and they turned their backs on him. Hidden in a pile of hay was Timothy Mouse, the smallest animal with the circus. They can't treat the little fellow that way, he muttered, not while Timothy Mouse is around. Hey there, little fellow, he called to Dumbo. Don't be afraid. I'm your friend. I want to help you. Timothy ran up toward Jumbo's ear. We'll get your mother out of jail, you and I together, and we'll make you the star of the show. You'll be flying high. Say, he went on, staring at Dumbo's ears. Those ears are as good as wings. I'll teach you to fly. Quietly, Dumbo crept out of the tent with Timothy and soon they came to the prison car on a siding. Dumbo told his mother all about the clown act and how unhappy he was without her and about the wonderful idea Timothy had for making him a success. Mother Jumbo listened sympathetically, stroking him gently with her trunk. Don't you worry, baby, she told him. You're having a hard time now, and I'm sorry I can't be with you to help. But just remember always to do your best, and as Timothy says, you'll soon be flying high. Then, sadly, they said good night, and Timothy and Dumbo continued on their way. Out on the bare fields in the starlight, they went to work. With Timothy as teacher, and Dumbo practiced running and jumping and hopping. He stretched out his wings and flapped them one, two, three, four. But hard as he tried, Dumbo could not leave the ground. At last, almost too tired to stand, the two friends gave up and started gloomily back toward the sleeping circus. Don't worry, Dumbo, Timothy whispered as he curled up on Dumbo's hat brim for a good night's sleep. We'll have you flying yet. So Dumbo fell asleep with a tired smile on his face and a beautiful dream in his heart. In the dream, he was flying as easily and gracefully as a bird soaring through the air high above the circus. It was a wonderful dream, and it seemed very real to Dumbo. When the morning sun arose, Timothy was the first to awaken. He blinked and looked up. Just above him, four old black crows sat and stared at him. Why, why, yawned Timothy, rubbing his eyes, where am I? You're up in our tree, snapped the crows crossly. That's where you are. Tree, gasped Timothy. He looked around. Sure enough, there he was sitting on a branch. He and Dumbo were up in a tree. The ground was far, far below. But, but how did we get here, he stammered. How, cackled the crows, you and that elephant just came a-flying up. Flying, Timothy yelled. Dumbo, Dumbo, wake up. Dumbo, we're up in a tree. You flew here. Slowly, Dumbo opened his eyes. He glanced down. He gulped. Then he struggled to his feet. But suddenly, he slipped on the smooth tree bark and fell down, down, and down. He bounced from branch to branch with Timothy clinging to his trunk. Plonk! 
They landed in a shallow pond just underneath the tree. The crows chuckled and cawed from above. Timothy scrambled up out of the water and wrung out Dumbo's tail. Dumbo, he panted, you can fly. If you can fly when you're asleep, you can fly when you're awake. Your ears, Dumbo, they're your fortune. He grabbed one of Dumbo's wet ears and patted it. You won't be a clown anymore. You'll be famous, the only flying elephant in the whole wide world. And Timothy and Dumbo began all over again to practice flying. But it wasn't easy. Time after time, Dumbo tried to take off. Time after time, he sprawled out flat on his face. Soon the crows began to feel sorry for the little fellow. When Timothy told them all the sad things that had happened to Dumbo because of his big ears, they flew down and offered to help. One of the crows took Timothy aside. Flying's just like swimming, he whispered. It's just a matter of believing that you can do it. He turned and snatched a long black feather from his tail. Here, take this. Tell the baby elephant it's a magic feather. Tell him if he holds onto it, he can fly. The boss crow winked and flew off. Timothy handed Dumbo the feather and scurried up his trunk to the brim of his cap. The trick worked like a charm. The very instant that Dumbo wrapped the tip of his tongue, trunk around the feather, flap, flap, flap one his ears. Up into the air he soared like a bird. Over the tallest treetops he sailed. He glided, he dipped, he dived. Three times he circled over the heads of the cheering crows. Then he headed back to the circus grounds. Timothy shouted, We must keep your flying a secret, a surprise for your act in this afternoon's show. No one noticed Dumbo when he and Timothy came quietly back. It was already time for Dumbo to get into his costume. Inside the walls of the cardboard house, he had to wait all through the show until the fire crackled up around him. At last, Timothy leaned down and handed him the feather. In just a second, Dumbo, he whispered, you'll be the most famous animal in all the world. Crack, crackle, crack, cackled the fire. The clown act was on. Flames shot up around the cardboard house. Clang, clang, roared the clown fire engine rushing toward the blaze. From the far end of the ring, a red-headed mother clown came running. Save my baby, she screamed. The fireman brought a big net and held it out. Jump, my darling baby, jump, shrieked the mother clown. Dumbo jumped, but as he jumped, the black feather slipped from his trunk and floated away. Now his magic was gone, and Dumbo plunged down like a stone. You can fly, Timothy shouted frantically. The feather's a fake. You can fly. Dumbo heard the shout and doubtfully spread his ears wide. Not two feet above the net, he stopped his plunge and swooped up into the air. A mighty gasp arose from the audience. They knew it couldn't be, but it was. Dumbo was flying. While the crowd roared its delight, Dumbo did power dives, loops, spins, and barrel rolls. He swooped down to pick up peanuts and squirted a trunk full of water on the clowns. The keepers freed Mrs. Jumbo and brought her to the tent in triumph to see her baby fly. So all of Dumbo's worries had come to an end. By evening, Dumbo was a hero from coast to coast. Timothy became Dumbo's manager, and he saw to it that Dumbo got a wonderful contract with a big salary and a pension for his mother. The circus was renamed Dumbo's Flying Circus, and Dumbo traveled in a special, streamlined car. But best of all, he forgave everyone who had been unkind to him, for his heart was as big as his magical ears. So I'm wondering, Deb, uh... Because this story is so special to you. I love this story so much. <laughs> I'm so glad you agreed that we could and should do it together on the podcast. It always makes me tear up. I just think it is 
uh, the most heartwarming story as a modern fairy tale, you know, and there's some other modern fairy tales like The Wizard of Oz, but this one really, uh, this one really lives in my heart. Do you remember it being introduced to you as a child? Did that come to you in a particular way? No, I I cannot even remember when I got to it, but it was it was later in life. It was not a childhood uh, favorite. I I it just passed me by because I think uh, this is a story that was written by I think a husband and wife team. Their story was never published, and Disney picked it up and put it out, I think, in a movie and as a series of their little golden books. And um, that, I never had any little golden books. I had library books, but no, uh, nothing from Disney. I didn't even know about Disney until I don't know how old. So what part of the story uh, brings such a well of feeling? The the part uh, that really, I think, where the nexus of the story is and where it gets me, which is your question, is that what the discovery that Dumbo has that the power resides in him and not in the feather. That he had believed uh, the crows and Timothy that it was because of the feather that he could fly. So there's an external source of power. And the discovery that he has the power in himself, uh, I think, is the big turning point of the story. So I'm drawn to just think about that as a psychological and developmental process for us as children and perhaps occasionally for us as adults that somehow we become aware of a potential and perhaps even something or someone outside of us says, hey, I see you can do this. I believe Mm -hmm. you can do this. I I see you've got all this stuff to be able to do one thing or another. Maybe that's a teacher in our lives. Maybe it's a parent. Maybe it's actually an employer later in life. Mm -hmm. Um, We're recognized. But somehow we don't have an inner relationship to that potential, or the ego image, the image of ourselves, just does not include um, that, I guess would be golden shadow, doesn't include that potential. So the feather, the feather represents some way, some transitional event or transitional mm-hmm. object that we can mm-hmm. invest the potential into. Mm-hmm before we can actually integrate it into ourselves. We need a way to project the potential in order to see it, which is just a bedrock Jungian uh, formulation. That Just like a, a film camera, we can't see the film when it's uh, wrapped up tight. It has to be projected literally onto a screen so we can see it. Um, and and so when kids dress up in costumes, um, my sister just loved having her Superman cape. She had concocted it out of God only knows what, but, uh, and she would leap off, uh, sofas and chairs, (laughs) kind of like Dumbo trying to fly. (laughs) Uh, and I'd look at her and go, whoa, (laughs) hope springs eternal. That's not going to work. Um, but at any rate, you, we, it's the cape. We need the projection. We need the material substance. Dumbo needed the feather. Um, the kids need their, their costumes. We, we need our talismans. Uh, I'm thinking about the talisman that Jung made for himself of this little mannequin and a pencil box with a special stone that was half, he painted half of it black, and he hid it way up in the attic where he wasn't supposed to go because it wasn't safe. And so he had something magical that existed apart from him that had some kind of special power that was never really defined. 
and and Dumbo had his feather, and my sister had her Superman cape. So uh, <clears throat> I'm thinking about um, uh, several several different kind of psychological perspectives. One is that the feather is a symbol, mm -hmm. so that there's a potential in the unconscious, and the ego has no way to imagine it. And so sometimes we will have a dream, and the dream maker will present some kind of an image. Mm -hmm. And if the image puts the ego in touch with something in the unconscious, then the symbol becomes the kind of mediating image that allows incrementally certain feelings, certain imaginings, certain mm -hmm. drives to interact with the ego and to kind of nudge it forward. And I think that's so central to our work, the idea mm -hmm. of symbols of transformation. So even though Timothy oh, that's, Mouse... That's lovely. Right? Uh, and of course, that's the title of one of the books in Jung's Collected Works, but it is. It's Symbols of Transformation. And that's exactly what the feather is and what many a symbol is. The potential. The potential, which, which and we really do need a symbol, or the ego mm -hmm. needs a symbol of it, in order to even have the feeling that something's possible before we may have developed the actual concrete skills to implement something. And I would imagine, and I would encourage the listeners, if they want to leave a comment in our YouTube channel, that you have a story of imagining something, finding something, dreaming of something, and as you were drawn to it, somehow the symbol helped you find something in yourselves some capacity mm -hmm. and sometimes it may seem very direct like uh, i had a dream about kind of a luminous and magical book and then many years mm -hmm. later i discovered that i loved writing or had a capacity for writing but sometimes it's much more nuanced than that mm -hmm. there are suggestions decades earlier of some potential that's going to actualize later in life and we get these imagistic mm -hmm. hints, which is really what dreams are. Is dreams often give us symbols of emergent potential and are nudging us, nudging us towards believing in mm -hmm. something and taking a risk, particularly mm -hmm. here. I, I really like that, that we have to have some way to envision, and symbols do that. And these talismans do that. Of, of how, if the potential does not take shape and form, you know, then how, how can we even begin to imagine it? And, and dreams send us those, those crazy ideas about um, writing a book or you know, doing any number of, of other things that then can take root in consciousness and begin to be actualized in the waking world. So we need a relationship to the potential somehow mm -hmm. in order to even experiment. Mm -hmm. One thing that I, I thought was interesting is that Timothy Mouth, to me, a Mouse mm -hmm. is a hermetic figure. He's a Hermes ah. figure. Okay. Uh, he's <laughs> just like Hermes. You know, he's a, he's a mouse. He can... He can get into all of these little places. He can run in. He can run out. Um, the mother has been separated from the child mm -hmm. in this somewhat tragic way, but it also represents a psychological and developmental process that at some point uh, all of us as children have to be separated from the kind of infantile dependencies. Mm -hmm. And so this is a process where Tragically, fate in the story has thrown him upon himself. And so there's an evocation of this hermetic character, mm. much like Jiminy, uh, Jiminy Cricket in oh, Pinocchio. Yes. Yeah. You know, there's this wise, instinctive potential, a kind of a small spirit mm -hmm. that is 
smart and sassy, and also not sentimental. And that's an interesting tension in the story because when Dumbo is separated from his mom, his mom is misunderstood, mistreated, this terrible misfortune. It's very easy to take a very sentimental attitude about poor baby Dumbo. Yeah. But uh, Timothy Mouse, he's not sentimental. He's, he's, he's kind of tough. He's pragmatic. He's like, come on, come yeah. on. Pick yourself up. Let's try some stuff. Yeah. Um, he's not scared. Timothy Mouse is all about the future. And mm -hmm. What do we do now? Okay, well, that's all too bad. Uh, and I'm just going to pick up on the th thread that you offered that I think is so good is how easy it is to become sentimental, to protest. Of That's awful. How could we... How could they do that? You can't separate a baby from its mother. That that's terrible. And then we go to social justice stuff. That is that was unfair. It was unjust. There was no due process. Um, wait a minute. You know those boys were bullies and so on and so forth. And that kid deserved the the spanking that he got. And then along comes Timothy Mouse. It says, "Okay, pick yourself up, dust yourself off. What what are we going to do with those ears?" Where's the potential? Let's move on. I really like that a lot. And, and I also love that it's a mouse right. because there are all these um, sort of uh, old housewife tales and little mythologems about um, elephants being scared of mice. Oh, yeah. Right? And then there's Ganesha, who, the uh, god in, in Hindu mythology, who has the body of a human and the head of an elephant. And he's a transformer, and at his feet, oh, there is a rat. Mm. So variation on on the mouse theme. Mm. The other thing that I think is hilarious in the story is that Timothy Mouse is with the circus. No, he's not. <laughs> he's just he's just hiding out somewhere, riding along, uh, getting free food, having the run of the place. Uh, he's not really an official part of the circus. I think that's great. He's a survivor. Yes. He's he's a grifter. He's, uh, yes, he's a <laughs> he's hitchhiker. He's the grain that's falling here and there. <laughs> exactly. He's a grifter. That that I like that a lot. And like Hermes, you know, Hermes can fly. That oh, is, that's right. He has wings on his heels and wings on his wrists. So, well, Timothy Mouse clearly doesn't fly. But I think archetypally, there's a little hint of something that's um, that, that I think is present in his mercurial ability to not get caught, to not get caught in emotions, mm -hmm. to not get caught and injured by forces that would want to attack him. I mean, as a mouse, he's also seen as a pest as something that people would go after and want to hurt. So there's also something about Timothy Mouse's attitude um, is an ego advancement. <laughs> that he's the mouse that, that people try to trap and hurt mm -hmm. and get rid of because he's some kind of pestilence. But he's a survivor. He's figured it all out, and he's figured out how to thrive. So when Dumbo is mistreated mm -hmm. and... Uh, undervalued and uh, chased. A mouse knows what that's like. So he is a wise later version of the survivor. Yes, exactly. Uh, and mice are also used, uh, Disney used mice in uh, their film of Cinderella uh, mm -hmm. to make Cinderella's dress. Mm -hmm. So there's something nimble about mice, that they can slither in the little cracks and they can dart around and they have a cleverness, a quickness to them, which is also, as you were saying, very hermetic. As you were saying that, I'm also thinking about how pivotal mouse's ears are. That, that's such an important <laughs> part of their navigation, mm -hmm. their ability to be safe in the world. Mm -hmm. And so there's... Uh, an, 
an interesting sense that the mouse understands the value of ears. <laughs> and, uh, and even though, again, his ears are even a pestilence in as much as mm-hmm. it's the thing that he's teased, it's the part that he's maligned for. Mm-hmm. But a mouse understands what ears can do. Oh, that's very interesting. Um, somehow, as you were talking, uh, what I was also thinking about Timothy Mouse is um, sort of the old saying about when life hands you lemons. Mm-hmm. You know, how can you turn misfortune into an advantage? Uh, so, if Dumbo has these giant ears and mice use their ears to great advantage, maybe mm-hmm. there's something really great about having such huge ears. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, you People know, just don't a, understand it. Yeah. Yeah. A glass half empty, glass half full, and Timothy's going, like, you know, I think we can do something with this. There's creative potential here. Um, and I'm going to take a little um, uncanny step into amplification. <laughs> it's, just a, it's just a strange little connection. Go for um, it. So... There's a, an ancient text called Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. Okay. And it, I know this, this it seems like it's coming out of nowhere, but it really is going to circle back in here. Okay. So um, th- there's a number of, uh, of axioms and ideas about consciousness and um, meditation and yoga, but there's a large section about the supernatural powers that the yogi could develop, which are called uh, cities. Mm-hmm. And in some traditions, even now, that this is something that's pursued, that if we can achieve a certain state of consciousness, a certain state of body, that we can facilitate extraordinary events around us. So in this method, one allegedly is able to slip into such a deep state of meditation that one is right on the membrane Mm. between the invisible and the manifest world. And in this theory, when you are sitting in that level, a thought can suddenly become a reality. And so, (laughs) Patanjali gives these... um, sequence of ideas, and if these ideas are held into that creative space, miraculous things can happen. And so the miraculous thought to make the yogi levitate is light as a feather. Oh, for heaven's sake. Well, you did say it was going to come full circle, and it just has. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Light as a feather. And uh, the mythology is that the yogi will suddenly be able to literally levitate in the room. So, so what that suggests to us as Jungians is there's an, there is an archetype. There's an idea for thousands of years that the feather itself, and if the feather is imagined even in the human psyche in just the right way, in just the right moment, <laughs> that something supernatural can happen. And of course, Dumbo's skills are supernatural. I mean, a baby elephant wouldn't be able to soar around like that, but Dumbo has a supernatural ability. It's interesting. I never, um, until this moment, actually somehow thought of it as supernatural, which shows you that some part of me is back there being 10 years old. But um, I think I thought more about it as uh, that what you believe you can do, you can do. I think there's a saying by Goethe that um, whatever you can do, begin it. Uh, beginnings have boldness and various other qualities to them. So I think I always thought of it as um, much more uh, whatever you believe you can do, you can do. Well, and it's a belief 
that is connected to capacity. Mm -hmm. So it's not so much that anyone in the circus could believe that they could fly and then they would. <laughs> But actually, Dumbo has a capacity. Exactly. He has a capacity. You know, the other part of the story that it always meant a lot to me is its relationship and how analogous it is to the therapeutic process. See that. And that's why, as an adult, I've always liked it. And I've even imagined myself at, myself at times of giving somebody a magic feather. That you you can do it. Uh, you have you have the power, but you need something to hold, an image to hold that that anchors it, anchors your potential to a real world actualization, and uh, as a way of bridging. Uh, potential into actuality, of imagining it into actuality. If, here's the, the talisman. And I will ask people, you know, is there a talisman? Is there something? We do it a lot with dreams. You know, if people dream of a particular animal or something, of, you know, is there something in the house or could you make something? Or just to keep that image in mind. And, of course, it's symbolic, and everyone is an adult and, and knows that, but it helps to see that little seal on the windowsill or on the bathroom counter and, and let it sit and grow uh, inside as a potential. What I'd like to add to that, which I think leans into your work with Gestalt, hmm. is that there does need to be some kind of a bridge between mm -hmm. the purely symbolic or conceptual and a kind of experiential learning model. So Timothy mm -hmm. Mouse helps bring forward the symbol, the light as a feather symbol. Mm -hmm. There's something so exciting inside of Dumbo, it puts him in touch with energy. But then the next thing, Timothy Mouse says, "Is now we have to conduct some experiments. We've got to do right. some stuff, <laughs> which in Gestalt work is, is very congruent. Like, here's a concept, but now we have to create some kind mm -hmm. of even a symbolic action. But something's got to happen yes. Yes. for the body to somehow experience even just an aspect mm -hmm. of it. Yep. Um, and that goes, too, to a very... It, a, real fundamental point, part of Jungian theory, and I'm sure it's not unique just to Jungian theory because it's embedded in Gestalt, is if you have a dream, whether it's a nighttime dream or a dream for some possibility in your life, you have to do something with it. You can draw it, you can dance it out, you can have a little figurine and speak to it, you can journal uh, you can do all kinds of things, but you have to kind of let yourself live into it imaginally in the waking world. And that's what Timothy Mouse does for Dumbo, and the crows do it. The light is a feather, and here's a feather. As, as a material bridge and a symbol so that Dumbo can begin to live into that. So just bringing this back into a kind of a developmental process. So the crows, they know they can fly. <laughs> yes, and, they do. They are, they're demonstrating this capacity. And so looking at a young one who has a fantasy mm. and to pass something to the young one, and it reminds me of... Um, being six years old and putting on my dad's suit or <laughs> wearing his shoes or wanting to dress up in mom's jewelry in some way that um, is symbols of something that's, again, advanced before us mm -hmm. is now going to be something that we're going to try on. Exactly. Get the football 
jersey, just like my hero in the <laughs> NFL. And I'm seven, but somehow yes. having something of the mature version mm -hmm. makes me feel like I'm closer and perhaps am psychologically closer in some way to the, to the actualized version. Mm -hmm. And we have to have that experience, a bodily experience, to connect our imagination with uh, living it out in, in the waking world. So you need the football jersey. You know, my sister needed the Superman cape. Um, but I also want to think about the relationship of, uh, and how it, it is a parallel for some part of the analytic process between uh, Dumbo and Timothy Mouse. And th that one of the possible sort of shadow sides of psychological theory is, you know, we're going to help you, whoever the you is, find whatever it is in yourself so that you can do it yourself. And that bypasses the crucial, necessary human relationship part of the process that is absolutely essential. Because if therapy is going to work, it has to inspire the possibility that you can find your center in a human relationship. We are wired for human relationship. <clears throat> We're born into the world and we wouldn't learn to smile, we wouldn't learn to talk, we wouldn't become human without a relationship. And People who come into therapy, I think people just worldwide have, we all have relational wounds, traumas, things that we didn't receive, things that we're missing. And we have to be able to find that in a relationship before we can find it in ourselves. Otherwise, it's sort of like telling people, well, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. And so um, there's the relationship with Timothy Mouse. It's not just the feather. Timothy reaches out and says, hey, this, is, this isn't right. And um, he's the hermetic figure. I see some possibilities here. Let's, let's, let's get on it. Um, so he helps Dumbo find his potential. But the relationship precedes everything else. It's Timothy being there, reaching out, and offering connection. I think that's absolutely correct. That, hmm. that Timothy had to take an interest in him, was moved by Dumbo's suffering, or the injustice of what had happened between him and his mom, and decided that he was going to help this kid, <laughs> take an interest yes. in this traumatized yeah. kid and instill a kind of audacity, a kind <laughs> yeah. of experimental courage. And even though Dumbo failed several times, Timothy Mouse is the one who holds the vision of Dumbo's potential before Dumbo has enough evidence yes. to actually be mm -hmm. the person that Timothy claims that Dumbo is. Yeah. And he does actualize it in that he, what then happens is that Dumbo does find it in himself, unconsciously. That's what I was just going to say. He, <laughs> okay. he has to dream it. <laughs> exactly. First. That They wake up in a tree and it's like, what? what the heck? How did we get here? And, and, and as soon as Dumbo wakes up, of course, he falls out of the tree, plonk, plonk, hitting, bouncing from branch to branch, and lands in a mud puddle. That the, that the unconscious has been activated, mm -hmm. and consciousness has to catch up. Beautifully said. So we may find ourselves fatefully bringing something creative forward and only to be surprised. Maybe we 
claim that we're going to do something at work and we don't know why we even agreed mm -hmm. to do something or something yeah. remarkably insightful pops out of our mouths <laughs> and we kind of don't, don't really know where that came from. There were so many inventors saying that they had a dream. Yes. And that was the missing key to the invention. Exactly. That um, The story that one of my favorite stories is that um, Elias Howe, who invented the sewing machine, tried and tried and tried and was stumped and invented this thing, but the, the threads didn't connect. And he had a dream of people marching uh, with spears that had a hole in the center. Mm. And then he got it, that, that the, the sewing needle had to have a hole in the center and the thread had to be threaded through that hole in the needle tip. And that then from there it was launched. But it's a parallel to what happened to Dumbo. He tried and tried consciously. He invented, he had machines, he worked at it all day. Then his unconscious supplied an idea and an image and then he went back into conscious effort to do all of the finagling and fiddling and tinkering to actually operationalize it as a sewing machine. And that's just what Dumbo does, is he tries and tries and he flops and fails and falls flat on his face. He flies up in a dream when he's asleep. The unconscious says, got this. And then consciousness has to go back to work at, you know, at two different levels. One is like, okay, I think I can do it because I have the feather. And then the next is, I can do it without the feather. <laughs> I'd also like to, um, to talk about the idea of the child that has an outsized or an oversized aspect of their character. Okay. So, so he's, he's a little guy. If he had whatever ordinary ears are, then he would fit into this familiar place. The other elephants or the rest of the culture would say, oh, you know, his ears are about the right size, his feet are the right size, has the right things. You know, he's what would be expected. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, and, and I've certainly had this experience with adults that I've analyzed that one of their character traits or one of their functions is so remarkably advanced that it dwarfs the other parts of their character and it puts them out of sync with the social environment. So mm. what I'll talk about is kids that are unusually talented. So um, children that have spectacularly high IQs. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had some analysands that had, you know, 140, 150, 160 IQs. Mm. And, you know, as I talk to them, they talk about the incredible distress that they felt as children. Mm. That, you know, there you are at seven, but you're thinking like a 30-year-old. Now, other parts of the psychology are not developed, but there's a sense that I am so different, so misunderstood, and often mistreated mm -hmm. because something is so highly developed, so much larger in the personality. On the other side, when there's a trait that's so developed, let's say like an extraordinary IQ, it can dwarf the feeling function. It can dwarf the sensation function because it takes up so much dynamic room in the psyche. So on the shadow side of it is that Dumbo's ears become the most important thing. As if other, other qualities that will develop in him don't quite matter. The other shadow of the story is Dumbo's ears are oversized relative to the fact that he's an infant, mm -hmm. but he's going to outgrow that. He's going to become as big as his mom or larger, and the adult ears that are on him are going to be average ears by the time he's a fully formed adult. 
So there's a celebration of something that's disproportionately developed to the rest of the personality and therefore is remarkable and extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the story, he has his own train and he, the mm -hmm. circus is named after him. <laughs> and, and the story goes on. Now that's an interesting supposition that uh, Dumbo's ears are basically fully grown when he's a baby, but that as the rest of him grows, um, everything will wind up being much more in proportion, uh, which kind of maps onto the idea of a child prodigy really very well, <clears throat> that as other parts of this gifted child uh, develop and catch up, um, that person can still have a special gift and talent, uh, but it's better balanced by other psychic functions that have had a chance to grow and develop. So even if you have an IQ of 500, uh, there are developmental aspects of every human being that simply take time to come online. Uh, we can't be um, adults before we're actually adults. But the other, um, the other idea is what if um, everything grows and Dumbo's ears are, <clears throat> get bigger and bigger along with his body getting bigger, and there's something that isn't quite as appealing, is there, in the image of this? <laughs> it's a little troubling. <laughs> <laughs> it's, and, and, and so what, what is that? that uh, we don't like the idea of a full-grown adult elephant being able to fly. It doesn't have the same kind of charm, does it? It's like, what the hell is that? <laughs> and in uh, Indian mythology, there are enormous godlike elephants that actually can fly or that some of the gods ride on, second seven-trunked elephants that huh. vault into the air. Um. But, but then it moves out of uh, it being adorable. Yes, something it sure does. Um, it, it has a different valence mm -hmm. to it. Yes, um, it, it does. So then he's kind of an aging child star with a oh. drinking problem or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Living out his days of glory, cracking peanuts, you know, <laughs> in his one-room apartment when he's 50. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! I think you, you you've just completely deflated this whole story for me. The, the post <laughs> postmodern chapter two of Dumbo. So, be that as it may, it ends in this kind of glorious celebration yeah. of this precocious mm -hmm. development. I've also been thinking about what does it mean. To, to have all this energy in the ears. Mm, um, just back to the ears. Just symbolically, right? And, and whatever the ears can do, which is primarily hearing, there's something perceiving, about... Perceiving, yeah. Right, perceiving and hearing. And if, and if that is mastered in the right way, one can, one can fly. Hmm. So that's a little bit of the story as well, that Dumbo starts and he's able to hear everything. And so much of what he hears is cruelty and uh, criticism and ridicule. And that when one has such large ears and one can hear every little comment in the crowd, you know, what is it that we take in? What do we internalize. So it may also be the story of a uniquely sensitive soul mm -hmm. that hears so much more than maybe the average person would. The average person might not even notice that somebody's in the corner making a face at them or pointing at them. But Dumbo's sensory organ, his ears are enormous. So how important it mm. is for him to find a different voice, and that Timothy speaks into the ear and gives him different mm -hmm. messages. And ears and communication are our social function. You know, all our senses serve all kinds of purposes in our development and 
physical being, all the rest of it. But we have to learn to speak and to hear to become social beings. And, you know, mothers talk to their newborn babies and sing them songs. And what on earth is the point of that? It's a two-day-old baby. Well, there's a lot of physiological purpose to that. We're all born with uh, the capacity to speak any of the world's languages. Mm -hmm. And by speaking and singing to the baby in whatever tongue that baby's going to learn to speak, the brain prunes uh, the excess cells or neurons that it's not going to need. You know, which is why it's so hard sometimes to pronounce things in a foreign language because that foreign language has, has sounds that we don't use in English and, and vice versa. Uh, so hearing and language uh, and that kind of social connection is, is huge and how it's our social sensitivity a lot of the time that we can, we, we can tell when somebody... You know, we walk into the office and someone says, good morning. It's like, whoa, well, what's up with Bob? <laughs> you know, uh, that, that we're, it's an organ of attunement. Yes, absolutely. And poor little Dumbo has uh, far too much of it. And that often happens with highly sensitive people. Of, it gets turned back on them. Of um, what do you you know? Why do you make such a big deal out of everything? Oh my God! Uh, just so sensitive. You got to watch every little thing you say. And this uh, is the little one who hears everything. Exactly. Which is also part of the mythology of elephants uh, that because their ears are so large that they are very sensitive and they can hear mm -hmm. the tiniest little yeah. thing. I, my, I have a theory that a lot of the people who show up in our consulting rooms are dumbos. They have great big ears, and they took in an awful lot of stuff right. that other people wish they hadn't paid attention to or don't pay attention to, and that no one has validated their ability to pick up all kinds of nuances in other people's psychology, dynamics, interactions, etc. And if we think of Dumbo as as we do in fairy tales, that this is all happening happening in a single psyche. Mm -hmm. So this is this is a, mm -hmm. a dream, one Dumbo dream happening in a <laughs> single person. So there's this um, discovery of enormous sensitivity, great hearing, that one tactic for managing the sensitivity is for the mother principle to go and want to punish the ones who are upsetting, mm -hmm. to try to change the outer world, to make it different so that I don't have to hear things that people say. And right now this is, this is a big um, struggle with our culture, you know, should an entire audience change its behavior so that a single attendee is not triggered mm. or doesn't hear something mm -hmm. that they don't want to hear because it's difficult for them to hear. So one thing that the mother does is she, she's deciding she's going to act on the environment so that right. Dumbo isn't exposed to certain things. Mm -hmm. And I guess in the imagination of the author, that's not a solution that the psych this particular psyche is going to happen, that we're going to put away that particular solution. And instead, what we're going to do is teach Dumbo mm -hmm. how to focus on what he's going to value of what he hears. So he could prioritize the envy or cruelty of other children, but there are also other voices saying, something really amazing happening here. Mm -hmm. You can really do something. And there's a shift from having to act on the bullies mm -hmm. to actualizing a potential. And then we get that phrase, you know, the, 
the best revenge is success. Yes. Instead of just acting on the ones who gave us pain or constantly focusing on them, mm -hmm. Timothy is, is so wise, and he says, let's, let's actually look in a totally different direction that's actually going to get you the things that you want, which isn't about shutting the bullies up. That, that, that's low. That's not going to yes. give you very much. Yeah. You've got to do something else with this. I think that what you've just said is so important. Of, do we uh, locate the problem out there with those boys that are bullies? I mean, that doesn't make it okay for those boys to be bullies. No one's saying that. That was awful, and it was hurtful. And Dumbo, as a little baby, felt just the hurt. Mm -hmm. He was tripping over his ears and so on, and he, he just felt hurt. He didn't feel like he needed to take revenge or anything. Mm -hmm. and, and then comes that next possibility represented by Timothy Mouse. Mm -hmm. Let's see what you've got in you that might represent some potential, and I'm going to help you. So, I think that uh, we've done a wonderful job uh, circling around uh, a tale that most of us know. Many of us, as young children, have seen the mm -hmm. cartoon Dumbo. Mm -hmm. Whether or not we've read the story, uh, it's, it's really kind of a universal yes. kind of image. and. I think it's so useful to, to take something that we take for granted, a story, a fairy tale, a folk tale that's just humming around in the background we don't give much thought to. And with the Jungian lens, we can find embedded in so many things mm -hmm. uh, a level of depth or possible depth that gives a whole other valence to something that's so familiar. I, I just always mm -hmm. love that about our conversations. Yeah, that in these simple and heartwarming stories lies a lot of depth, a lot of psychic truth, uh, which is why they last. And that the unconscious hears it. <laughs> yep. The unconscious has the biggest ears. <laughs> I like that a lot. So before we transition into a dream. Okay. I would just like to remind our listeners that we have an educational platform that Deb and Lisa and I have co-created called Dream School. We've mentioned it many times, of course, on the podcast. We really hope that you will give it a look. We have a wonderful informative page on our website, and what we hope is that we can provide information and experiences so that you'll be able to look at a story like this, mm -hmm. interpret it like a dream, to find a dream perhaps that's been mysterious in your life and unpack it, decipher it, to think about it from multiple different angles and have a surprising insight that opens something up, a capacity up inside of you. So we hope that you'll jump over to the website, thisjungianlife.com, but really try that this time mm -hmm. and click on Dream School and just look at the offering. Look at what's possible there. This is a dream from... A older woman, uh, and here's her dream. I was walking in a forest, maybe with my husband. We came to a part of the path that was too steep downhill and too muddy to walk down safely. A park ranger appeared at the bottom of the steep part and asked if we, we would like to ride an elephant down, and soon I found myself astride an elephant. We were going down the track but I was facing backwards. I assumed the elephant was walking backwards, the way people get down a ladder. But then I realized I was facing the tail end, and the elephant was, in fact, walking forward. 
I was worried about slipping off. Then we were walking in a trench beside a flat road. The ranger said the trench was for elephants to keep them safe from traffic, but that our elephant had had to go off for a procedure, maybe a fertility treatment. We came to a town, and I saw a poster on a pole, but I forget what it said. And our dreamer adds for context that she has grown children but no grandchildren. Uh, She has family and money. She doesn't have any family, money, or health problems. Um, And she wonders what can give meaning to her declining years. The main feelings in the dream, she says, were enjoyment of nature, trepidation, and mild excitement. So we have an elephant dream. Absolutely. (laughs) So, as often, we'll just start with the initial setting. Yes. So, the dream ego is walking in a forest. Maybe it's with her husband, but it's unclear. Mm -hmm. What seems more important is that she's in a forest. Yes. And so many stories begin in a forest. (laughs) Dante's Inferno uh, starts, somebody's walking in a forest in a dark wood. That's right. Little Red Riding Hood going into the forest. Beauty and the Beast. Hansel and Gretel. (laughs) Uh, A lot of stuff happens in the forest. (laughs) A lot of stuff happens in the forest. And it's that transition from, uh, for instance, the, the town, the city, which is a construct of conscious human civilization, and represents whatever the values are in the culture and the individual. But once we step out, we're in the forest and we're in the unpredictable, we're mm. in nature, we're in the unconscious in one yes. way or another. Yep. And interestingly, the dream ego is the center of consciousness in this churning instinctive system. So the trees are not thinking about what they do, they're just being trees, and foxes are just being foxes, and birds are just being birds. But the dream ego enters in, in some ways, as both the witness, the one who is thinking about the unconscious, but also is subject to it. Mm -hmm. So much of civilization is about protecting us from nature. We'll have walls and roofs so we don't have to be cold or feel the wind or we don't have to deal with uh, predators or pests. So we, let, left to our own devices, we would limit how nature can interact with us. But here the dream maker says, we're, we're going to put you in a world where you're going to have an encounter mm-hmm. with things that you likely cannot control. So the next part of the dream is a descent. And that is very mythological of having to descend, having to go down. The path is too steep and it's too muddy for humans to navigate. And then we have this guide like the woodsman in a lot of fairy tales, the park ranger is there. So I have an idea, you know, I... You could ride down on an elephant, uh, something larger, and that will help you make the descent safely. You need something bigger that can hold its footing on the steep, muddy trail. And then our dreamer finds herself finds herself facing backwards. No, the elephant does not have to walk backwards like going down a ladder. The elephant is fine. He's going straight ahead. But she's facing the tail end, which I think is really uh, really pretty significant. And she's worried about slipping, slipping off. So here's a metaphor for a psychic uh, descent. Um, and oftentimes when we face a, a real crossroads in life, like, you know, I'm in my 70s, I'm retired, and what do I do now? It's like, what else can I do? Where else can I go? What, what are the possibilities for growth or 
adventure or you know, something new. And Psyche says, let's go down a steep, muddy path on an elephant with you facing the tail end. So the, she says that it's, the path is too steep downhill. What's interesting is the dream ego doesn't consider trying another path somehow feels that mm-hmm. going forward means going downhill, mm-hmm. that there's some energy. Mm-hmm. And when we think about going downhill, then there's a sense we've been on a hill yeah. or on up a mountain. High. We've been up there, time to go down here. Right. So these mountaintop forests, which mm-hmm. in mythology are often associated with the spiritual particularly these very high mountain ranges, we look up and they're ringed with clouds. So it's mysterious. There's something where the heavens Mm. and the earth meet at the top of hills or the top of mountains. So it may very well be that she's had some rarefied experiences (laughs) or perhaps she's a retired teacher. Maybe she's had a very rich uh, intellectual life, perhaps. But it's time. Mm-hmm. It's time to come down from the mountain yes. back into the valley. Um, and, there, and there's something for that. But there's a risk, as you said, that the descent could be handled badly or the transition from whatever mm-hmm. the state of consciousness is on the mountaintop to whatever it means in the valley. It's slick. Mm-hmm. There's been rain. <laughs> there's no steps. She feels vulnerable doesn't feel like she can just grab from tree to tree, that gravity could just slam her down into the valley. Um, I'm really sort of reaching in um, with imagination, and of course we don't have the dreamer here, but um, all that said, I'm associating the height uh, prior to the descent with her being a retired teacher. Mm -hmm. She didn't say she's just retired. Yeah. But we we all, I think, have so many years of claiming a professional identity. Mm-hmm. I was a retired lawyer. I'm a retired, you know, anything that you can name. I spent many years practicing this profession. And in a classroom, the teacher is an incredible authority. Uh, and so I'm wondering about whether there's a descent there of letting go, even though she's already retired, but letting go of some kind of an identity as an authority, of somebody knowledgeable and and a guide. And now the guide in the dream is the park ranger. He knows he knows the terrain, the, the physical muddy path terrain. And I think it's absolutely fascinating that she's given an elephant to ride. Of what, what a gift. What a magnificent animal an elephant is. And in the Western world, it, it really carries a lot of symbolic significance because it's not, we, don't, we don't live in an environment where elephants are just part of the, of the usual scene, uh, where they're real beasts of burden and... We've all seen movies of them um, moving logs and helping people build houses, and they were the tractors of the ancient Asian world, mm-hmm. weren't they, essentially? Absolutely. The way the um, ox was an engine of civilization mm-hmm. in Europe. Yeah, I like that. They are engines. And also, they can be images of the self, Mm-hmm. Uh, because they're so big. Um, and in the water, whales often carry that kind of symbolic meaning. So she's given something really wonderful to help her with this transition. I think that's wonderful. And statistically, we know that many people, mm-hmm. they'll look forward to retirement. It's, it, oh my goodness, that's going to be great. They have all these plans. <laughs> They retire, and very shortly after, they can slip into a serious depression. Uh, And they're surprised. They thought it was just going to be a wonderful relief. Mm -hmm. But the descent 
can be so fast, or perhaps there's not enough time. So what's nice about the elephant also is it's it's slower. It's a step. Elephants are not going to slide down the muddy mountain. Right. There's time to transition, and yeah. she's facing backwards. So as the elephant slowly mm-hmm. descends, not slipping quickly, she can look backwards and regard what is being left behind and have time oh, to do I, that. Oh, I like that a lot. I, I was thinking of it more as um, an image of the relationship between the ego and the unconscious. The, mm-hmm. the, but I like it. It still works that the ego is looking back and having a reflection on what was, where I've been, and is afraid of slipping off. Mm-hmm. While the unconscious, uh, forward-moving part of the psyche is doing just fine navigating the muddy trail. And I imagine that an elephant's weight would make it unlikely to slip. Mm-hmm. Uh, I imagine it would be sure-footed, or at least this elephant, elephant surely is. This elephant sure-footed. is definitely. Um, so it's a little discomforting, but it... Uh, I, I like that, that one part of the psyche looks forward and navigates the trail ahead, and one part of the psyche, the ego part, reflects on where I've been, what I've yeah. done, what am I leaving. And she feels a little shaky, just as you said, mm-hmm. that um, you know, the elephant is, and we don't even know if the elephant's aware of her very much, mm-hmm. but uh, she, the ego has to... Hang on, the egos can't be totally <laughs> passive, carried like a baby. Mm-hmm. You know, she's got to stay balanced. She's got to make sure her, her legs or her hands are gripping yeah. something. She can't go to sleep. Nope, and she's going to be uncomfortable and be a little anxious, like, oh, God, what if I fall off? Um, that's part of it, too. I'd, I'd also <laughs> like to just talk about the park ranger. Um, okay. He appears at the bottom of the steep part and somehow seems to be speaking upwards, is able to communicate that, you know, if she'd like to to use the eye, if you want to use the elephant, (laughs) I'll offer this to you so you can come on down. And uh, there's a wonderful um, Mm -hmm. image in uh, Sufi mysticism that there is a guide that emerges from the green foliage called Kidir. Uh-huh. And uh, he is also part of that, that helping part of the unconscious and often positive animus image in a mm. woman's psyche, just steps out of the greenness and companions, offers the bit that's missing that's essential. So uh, there's something ancient about the the one that steps out of the woods mm. and, and can help and does help. Oh. He also offers, he says, would you like to ride an elephant down? Yeah. So it's really up to the ego. Like, can you recognize that you need this help? Mm-hmm. Will you accept help from the unconscious? Or if you're feeling really um, full of swag or maybe a little inflated, you might just try to do this yourself and have... Whatever yeah. happens. And good luck with that. <laughs> so there's some humility in the ego. Mm-hmm. She's aware of her vulnerability, and then yeah. she can accept the help. And, and that, to me, is so important in life transitions, is that often when we get scared, for whatever reason, we can find ourselves being inflated, mm-hmm. and we're angry and justified or overly optimistic or living with a bunch of fantasies. Um, but if she, because she stays in touch with her own vulnerability, then she can access more resources internally and perhaps even externally. And she gets to the flat road at the mm-hmm. bottom. Yeah. So mission, mischief managed, mission accomplished. Yep. She's done it. And then there's a little denouement there. That there's a, then we're walking in a trench beside a flat road, and the guide says, Oh, this is for the elephants. 
to keep them safe from the traffic, you know, sensibly that you know, it's if like they a wander bike lane. In, yeah, a bike lane. <laughs> if they wander over into the traffic, they could get hurt, hit, or there would be a disaster. Mm -hmm. So these, as enormous and powerful as they are, they have to be kept safe and just on that line of the unconscious. You know, if we think about um, the shoulder of the road is the mm -hmm. liminal space, you know, between the high traffic ego world and the forest or the bank of trees that's over to the side. And the elephants are just to the, just to the side of that transitional space. And there is some truth that if the ego gets overly involved in certain things, it can actually interfere. It can muck things up. Mm. But sometimes we have to trust that there is a spirit of life mm -hmm. that is, is there to help us. So that if the ego decides it's going to stick its hands in <laughs> and force everything to be its own way, you know, our inner elephants might get hit by trucks, um, that things can be mm -hmm. too yeah. controlled by the left side of the brain. It's a lovely image that there is this special, special road f just for the elephants, just for that part of the psyche. Uh, but then there's this part at the end that I often sort of uh, refer to in my own mind as the kicker. Mm -hmm. uh, everything is going along just fine, and then all of a sudden it's right at the very tail end. It's like, what? Our elephant has to go off for a procedure, maybe a fertility treatment? What? Wait a minute. Um, where did that come from? What are we talking? <laughs> that wonderful irrational bit yeah. that starts in. Right. And so, but of course, you know, I could, you know, venture the supposition that our dreamer, what part of our dreamer might need to be fertilized, to have something new, to have something growing, to have something uh, springing up in, in her. Um, you know, where is the generative spirit? So, so the the elephant has become our elephant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but the the elephants are going down the track, but mm -hmm. our elephant. So now she's got a relationship That's with her special right, it's elephant. Our elephant. So I, that this great um powerful engine in the unconscious, yeah. this life force yeah. is um, going to go and get some assistance mm -hmm. to be fertile for mm -hmm. this next stage of her life. Yes. You know, as we have wended our way through this dream, I, the feeling in me and f the feeling that we all have about one of our own dreams or if someone tells us a dream really matters. I am just filled with the feeling of what a very beautiful, wonderful gift of a dream this is. And what a wonderful uh, look ahead for this dreamer's future, for what the descent has been made. Uh, there's been an elephant. Um, our elephant is going to have a fertility treatment. Um, that's something new is here. And it's going to take a, a bit of energy that mm. one would say, if it's a procedure, that there's been a little difficulty in fertilization. Mm -hmm. um, and, and generally speaking, that, that might be a female elephant who's going to mm -hmm. have some uh, you know, hormone injected or some <laughs> process is going to uh, move it into mm -hmm. some actively fertile uh, stage so that it can then receive seed yeah. and gestate and give birth. Mm -hmm. So for, for something to become more fertile, it means that the environment is prepared to receive and gestate something from outside itself. Mm -hmm. The new thing, the new seed idea, yeah. the new impulse, vision, the plan for the next stage. Yeah. 
And while that's going on, somewhere in the unconscious, the ego has come to a town, there's a pole, there's a poster, and she's transitioning into civilization, the world yeah. of the town, other people, relationships, mm -hmm. cultural opportunities. Yeah. That's um, such a good point, and I'm back to uh, the transition into a non-professional identity. This is our, in a way, it's a come down. You know, I'm no longer the retired authority engineer, teacher, whatever it might have been. I'm just Deb. Mm -hmm. And the good news is, hmm, I wonder more about that. What what else is there to just oneself? And what she says in the context is she's got grown children but no grandchildren, and she's fine in terms of um, you know, money, health, outer world resources, but what can give meaning to my declining years? Mm -hmm. And I think this dream is saying they're not declining years. You've come down the, the, the hill and it was muddy, but you had an elephant. Now the elephant will have some fertility treatment, which means mm -hmm. new growth is what's lying ahead. Mm -hmm. And as you've said, she's going into town. Mm -hmm. the, the world of ego constructs, all the buildings and cultural uh, things that, that humans build, that something lies ahead that doesn't feel at all declining. And there's a poster on a pole <laughs> And a poster is generally an announcement about yes. some event. Yep. There's a, a concert or something or other is happening, and it's being promoted. So yes. a poster represents, I would say, an opportunity, news mm -hmm. about an opportunity. Yeah. And it's not quite clear what that is yet. It's not clear what she's going to think about it. But posters are invitations. Yes. Yeah. Something good is, is out there. We want you to know about it. Come on down. It is. So we're very grateful that the dreamer submitted her dream. And also, um, as you scroll down, whether this is on YouTube or in one of your um, podcast listening pro programs, uh, scrolling down, you can submit a dream through one of the links down at the bottom there after the show notes. And so it'd be wonderful to hear from more of you and for you to share your dreams if you'd like us to consider it for interpretation on one of the podcasts. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.